Hello and welcome everybody to our April 2024 webinar series, Restoring Nature, Building a Sustainable Future. And uh, today's webinar two, which is a, kind of a fun format today. It's Ask Me Anything with Dr. Elaine Ingham and team. So uh, let's just talk about the April 2024 Restoring Nature webinar series. So we had webinar one, which was the flourishing path with uh, John Liu. And that happened on Wednesday, March 27th. And there is a replay. So by all means, if you missed it or you want to rewatch it, go ahead and and uh, find our link for webinar one. And today's webinar two. So this they asked me anything with Dr. Lane and team. And then we have webinar three coming up, which is Restoring Watersheds with Andrew Millison and John Liu. And that's going to be on Thursday, April 18th at 7 p.m. GMT or 11 a.m. Pacific time frame. And just remember, all these uh, webinars are recorded and you can replay them. So if you miss them or want to rewatch them, they're available for you to peruse. All right, uh, let's get through some uh, kind of guidelines for today's webinar. Uh, everybody will be in muted mode except for the, uh, the panelists, just to make sure we get really good audio quality for all the attendees. And then this is going to be really around the questions that you folks have. Um, and so what we're going to want you to do is um, in the Q&A section, if you have a question that you want the panelists to be able to answer, uh, make sure it's at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Click on the Q&A button. We also have the chat button, which is just a great space to be able to converse with other attendees. And in fact, I see very good usage of the chat. In fact, I forgot to ask people where they're coming from, but you guys are already, so many of you have attended these webinars before. Everybody's already put it in there from where you're coming from. So thank you very much for doing so. So just remember though, if you have a question you want panelists to be able to answer, don't put that question in the chat section because it could likely get missed. Uh, put it in the Q&A section. So make sure you click on the Q&A button. And other than that, please enjoy. So let's talk about our topics here. We, we really have about 10 minutes. We're going to go through introductions, just kind of, you know, uh, the guidelines that we just covered and so forth. Uh, and then we're going to have about 50 minutes uh, to ask anything of our panelists. And so Elaine, Lloyd, Adam, and myself. And today's webinar is going to run about one hour total time. So let's get into our panelists here. So panelists, please introduce yourselves. Dr. Elaine Ingham, take it away. Had to un unmute me. Oops. <laughs> um, yeah, I think everyone would probably know who I am. I sort of started all of this some 45, well, it actually it's about 50 years that I've been working on soil biology. I'm trying to understand the whole interaction and uh, going from, um, you know, the when I was a student, um, in the university, the attitude about organisms in the soil where they're not important, they don't do anything, they're they're just there, I guess, because Mother Nature likes the way they look or something like that. No, they're doing very important things, and you can't grow plants um, <clears throat> uh, if you don't have the right microbiology in your soil, basically. You have to do the best you can with the toxic chemicals. Well, you're going to eat something that is completely covered with toxic chemical, uh, not too bright. So, yeah, that's me. I cause trouble all the time. <laughs> Head troublemaker in charge, right? Yes. Good job, Elaine. <laughs> all right, Dr. Adam Cobb. Well, if you're the chief troublemaker, Elaine, then you're training me well because <laughs> I'm also always looking for good trouble. Um Folks may know that I've been on several of these webinars and our student webinars and give other public talks for the school as my role is science communicator. And also I get to be part of the team as we create content here at the school for um, our new courses, especially. I'm very excited about um, what's going on with the ecosystem restoration communities in general. And I've actually been a huge fan of John Lewis for years. <laughs> so I am excited to be here today and just um, get a feel for what the community wants to learn about. Great. Thanks, Adam. Loida. Hello, my name is Loida Vasquez. I am uh, an instructor for the Soil Food Web School, uh, and I'm also the lead uh, and trainer for the, cons the consulting training program uh, at Soil Food Web School. Uh, I also uh, own and operate a consulting company called Regenerative Soils 101. Uh, my permanent residence is in California, but I spend some time in Mexico because I have some clients there that pull me there every now and then. Great. Thanks, Loda. 
And I'm Brian Bagg. I'll be your host today. I am a soil food web consultant. Um, I have two consultancy businesses. One is Sprouting Soil, which my wife and I created. And then uh, we combined forces with some folks you may be uh, have heard of, uh, Keisha and Casey Ernst of Catalyst Bio Amendments. We created a company called Soil Matters so we can do very large scale projects and leverage each other's skill sets. Uh, I am based out of Oregon and yeah, just living the life, helping transform uh, farms and growing operations to farming with biology as a focus so all right thank you panelists so i say let's jump right into this we've got questions aplenty i think coming in so first question and this came from an instagram user uh before we the, the actual webinar started and the question is on large services where is it difficult to where it is difficult to apply extract by a spray and must be done via irrigation if the irrigation rate is one millimeter per hour, and that's 10,000 liters an hour in one hectare, and you inject for 30 minutes, how do you calculate how much compost extract to apply and in what concentration? And Lloyd, I think you had some thoughts on this one you want to be able to share? Sure, absolutely. Um, it, to answer what concentration, or to answer the part of the question of how much extract should I apply, it's a little difficult because it depends on how much uh, biology you were able to extract out of your compost. Uh, but what I can answer is how to apply the extract uh, via irrigation. And as you had mentioned before this meeting, I mean, before the seminar, Brian, uh, we, we allow the irrigation to run, you know, five to 10 minutes in the beginning, then you inject the, the extract for another 10 minutes. And then you allow the uh, irrigation to run without the extract for the last 10 minutes of your 30 minute cycle. And the reason we wanna do that is, uh, is to wash out all uh, of the extract, all the organisms out of the, the, the irrigation tape uh, so that it doesn't cause any clogging or any uh, future problems. Uh, and how much uh, liquid should you apply? I always say as much as you can, how much uh, extract should you apply as much as you can uh, until you start seeing those populations uh, start reaching in the soil, start reaching the number, your targeted number, and then you wanna start backing off from uh, uh, those total liters that you're applying in extract. Yeah, I like, to, I like to take um, samples of the soil or the leaves and look at what's your existing biological load in there. Do you have bacteria and fungi, protozoa and nematodes on the leaf surfaces, top and bottom? Do you have them in the soil where the roots are? If you are, um, if you're getting somewhere around 135 micro, um, micrograms per gram of bacteria, um, uh, 135 uh, for your fungi as well. Uh, you want to be having 10,000 um, protozoa beneficial, the good guys, please, not the bad guys, um, in your soil and on your leaf surfaces. And you want to see a couple of good guy nematodes. And so when you take samples from your soil, you should be seeing these levels or higher. So we know you have the minimum amount necessary to establish all of the things we've shown are uh, that uh, the beneficial organisms um, uh, uh, perform for your plants. So you can keep monitoring. You know the you know you put the compost extract in, um, let it have three to seven days to. Um, get that, those populations built up, get the foods from the plant to be growing these organisms. So come back and take another sample, you know, like day seven, and you can see how much your biology has in, increased. If you're now over the minimum levels, yay, you can expect that you're going to get a lot of benefits. Now you might want to also um, be real particular for the plant you're trying to grow. And so and maybe you need to be a little bit higher in the fungi because you're growing blueberries uh, or a whole lot higher than that if you're growing apples, for example. So a little understanding of what the plant is that you're trying to grow. We typically need to know some information about that as well. Ooh, Brian, can I do my allegory thing? 
Go for it. I couldn't <laughs> stop you anyways, Adam. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They're too good. This question is asked trying to apply the chemical agricultural mindset to biology, and that does not work. At universities have trained people for years to say, you know, between the hours of 8 a.m. and 9 a.m., apply product A, and then over here, between the hours of 11 p.m. and 12 p.m., uh, apply product B, and they tell you the rate and how much, and people just, that that's how we've been trained to think. I was trained to think that way. But in reality, with biology, the thing that makes the most sense to me is when I started thinking about tuning a ukulele. The ukulele has four strings, and you have to tune each string, change the tightness of it, listen with your ear, change the tightness, the next string, the next string. When you get all four in tune, you can play beautiful music on a ukulele. The four groups of organisms that we teach here as the foundation of a healthy soul food web, bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and nematodes, we have to use a microscope to tune what's going on in that system. Say, do I have enough fungi? Are they diverse enough? Are they abundant enough? Ooh, I need to do something. I need to add more fungi into this system. Do I have any protozoa? You tune all four instruments and then you watch how things change and you adjust. And there's no math that makes perfect sense. It's not a recipe. It's learning to play music with the biology of the system. Usually said. Thanks, Adam. Uh, the only thing I would add just more from a, a practical, maybe technical aspect, uh, we've, we've co-opted the term fertigation. So fertigation is where you put fertilizer through the irrigation system. Um, in this sense, we can put compost extracts through the irrigation system. Uh, just be aware that there are some things you have to pay attention to. One, are there filters in the irrigation system that you're trying to inject into, uh, making sure that you understand where they're at, how you can bypass them and so forth. The other thing too is, are there gonna be a particle size limitation on the emitters that you're using in your irrigation system? Some of the uh, emitters that are used will clog fairly easily with the size of particles that we typically make in a compost extract. And so you need to filter that down even farther to kind of match that, that particle size. Um, and so there's just some things that you really need to pay attention to if you're going to go down the route of fertigation. I'm a huge proponent of it. I have a lot of my clients that we do fertigation with because it's probably the most efficient way to deliver organisms out to the fields. Um, you just need to make sure that you kind of check in all the different possible areas that potentially could cause you problems and find an alternative way or some way to be able to mitigate some of those issues. So, all right, I think we did justice on this. What do you think, panelists? All right, let's move on to the next question. Uh, the next question is, how can the soil food web method be applied to paddy fields in Baharat? Who would like to take that one? I was up for that. So sure, like, go ahead, Elaine. You, you jumped in before <laughs> I did. Yeah. Oh, darn. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So paddy fields in Baharat, I'd have to go over there and look and learn a little bit about the problems that they have in that part of the world. Probably a lack of moisture. So you, you got to find about, um, you know, when are the normal uh, places that you're going to plant your uh, material in there that you're going to have uh, irrigation that will keep, uh, you know, a couple inches maybe of, of water on the surface. You may have to put um, cloth of some kind or something to prevent evaporation. So there are a number of things you've got to take a, a gander at and figure out how you're going to do it. So how can the specifically the soil food web method be applied um, to paddy fields? Well, um, just add the um, or, uh, extract into the irrigation water. And so as that water goes through the irrigation system, um, you're applying the organisms to the foliage as well as to the root system. If you're just um, adding the um, uh, microorganisms to the water and then um, flooding the system, uh, you're going to want to uh, uh, do a little bit of hand 
uh, irrigation of some kinds where you're getting the organisms on the surfaces, top and bottom of the leaves um, of the um, of the plant you're, you're growing here. And as it starts to go into reproductive mode, you want to make certain that you're covering those reproductive tissues um, so that the diseases and the pest organisms um, can't give you problems. Um, so that's generally how I would look at, um, you know, the soil food web method applied in paddy fields. Well, as things dry down in the late, before harvest, typically, you know, you'll get dry surfaces so that you can drive back and forth. Just make sure that there is enough active organisms in all of your uh, surfaces of your of your plant in the root system on the stems on the um, rice itself as it's uh, produced the seed so that you don't have any diseases or pest problems um, in the growth of your plant. Well said. Uh, anybody else want to add on? I'll, I'll put in chat a link to um, the one of the international consortia groups that does rice research because they've been trying to shift people into more aerobic rice instead of these anaerobic patties over time. And they have very impressive results. I think a lot of it has to do with getting that biology more balanced in the system. Wasn't that also part of the one straw revolution? Didn't he grow in more aerobic? Um, yeah. Yeah. Really possible to do. Lowland rice is typically grown in patties and upland rice varieties, not and yep. there's a lot that has been gained with our understanding that paddy cultivation fixes a few problems, but creates a lot more. Great. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, you really don't want to eat rice that smells anaerobic. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay, uh, let's move on to another question. Uh, this question from another Facebook user said, what are the options for applying extract tea compost when the ground is baked dry and the forecast rainfall doesn't materialize time and time again? Anybody want to take this one? I think, yeah, I think it was, uh, I think it's me. Okay, <laughs> so um, uh, unfortunately, if you are depending on rain, uh, to you know to come then you're at the at the will of the weather right uh what i would do in this situation well first of all you want to apply these things when the soil is somewhat moist uh don't apply these liquid amendments on purely dry soil soil uh and so if you're depending on rain then i would go for extracts okay because the teas take quite some time to to make and if it doesn't rain then you just have all this tea left um, that uh, is not going to be very effective when you apply it to really dry soil but extract you can make within uh 20 to 20 minutes to two hours depending on what extraction system you're using so i would stick to applying uh, uh extracts um so yeah, uh, and, uh, I've I've worked or lived in really uh, dry areas, and uh, the best uh, uh, the the best choice in in that situation is just to apply after a rain after it rains for a couple of hours. It kind of just being ready, you know, mm -hmm. that when the forecast of rain is coming, that, uh, that you're ready to go if the, the rain does come, right? To, to be able to, to put it down. Is you, again, you have a window. With folks that are irrigating, you can artificially choose when you want to be able to do that. But like Lotus said, when you're in a situation where you're dryland farming, where you're relying upon the natural hydrology cycles to to occur, then then for sure you just got to be ready to go. And you'd probably want to do something along the line of increasing the organic matter in the soil, so that you know when you're irrigating when you put that material down in the ground it's moist enough to give you that initial um, growth of the plant that you want to see um, yeah they rice has very particular timing that it um, will be able to deal with the dry intervals when 
you can't when you aren't getting enough rainfall but if you're giving the you know the seven days the 14 days the 23rd you know I, i'm just pulling numbers out of my brain um, you want to make certain that you're uh, keep, keeping moisture in the soil um, w and a, one way to do that is to have really good organic matter levels in the soil and the microorganisms then can build themselves uh, some um, you know our apartments in the soil where they're not going to be as bothered by the low amount of water. You get down below the evaporation level for your particular plant, the roots should grow through that. Any water that does get on the, the surface of that soil, that water needs to um, move through, infiltrate down below the evaporative layer in your soil. So now your roots are down below that. They're going to be able to take as much water as they need without us realizing that there's uh, quite a bit of water down there held because the plants, the roots are pulling that water up. And so you're maintaining the cycle. The plants are getting plenty of water. And the nice thing is it's compounding of impacts too, that the the more the biology starts to establish, the more we start to build structure in the soil, the more organic matter gets laid down, the more the water holding capacity increases uh, in the soil. And so it gets better over time and you're able to hold more of that moisture and lose less to evaporation. Okay, anything else panelists before we move on? All right, next question. This question is from another Facebook user. Um, how do we brew protozoan infusions if there aren't any protozoa on the leaf surfaces of our local plants due to air pollution? Is the first thing that pops into my head, how do we use this approach in places where there isn't access to compost materials like the desert? Who would like to take this one? You know, in general, I would point people towards more wild type ecosystems in their bioregion, right? Within X number of miles of where they are. I mean, it depends. Texas has like three bioregions, for example. Some countries get split by bioregions, but I'll put the link to One Earth so people can see what I'm talking about. Um, because the biota will be well adapted for the area that you're in and the organisms. Uh, for example, we get reports reports from some folks that um, their organisms are more heat tolerant in their part of the world. Uh, and that can even affect composting temperatures versus in other parts of the world. So we need to understand the role of local biota. But I don't want people to go tear up all the wild type ecosystems, right? right. So we need to use methods where we sample a very small part of that ecosystem, take collect a very little bit of leaf material or decomposing leaves or um, roots or soil, and then propagate those organisms. And that's one of the reasons why uh, I'm such a believer in Elaine and Loida's methods that they teach of composting. I learned so much from both of them, and I have a big compost pile that I consider to be my own refugia of local organisms that I can grow and expand and add to and use to inoculate future piles. And uh, I'm even planning to dig a little trench and put some of the material in there and try to add worms to it to see if I can increase the quality of the biological community even more. So from a very small sample in local wild type natural areas, you can grow out your protozoa, your nematodes, your fungi, and, and, and create your own resource pool. But for many people, having sufficient organic matter and diverse organic matter is like the number one challenge in their region. So I don't wanna dismiss that. There's a, a preciousness to organic matter, especially when you get to places like the desert. You know, so if, if you're in an operation where you're burning your residues or you're shipping your residues off, uh, don't do that. You know, make sure you hold on to that organic matter as much as you possibly can. You know, I, I live in an environment in Oregon coast where organic matter is not a problem. <laughs> in fact, 
everybody's trying to give as much wood chips as they possibly can away. I do not have an or organic matter problem, but you go into the desert where there's very little organic matter, then it's very, very precious. Make sure that you're capturing and using that organic matter as, uh, as best as possible. But it doesn't take that long, you know, maybe a couple years to start building up that soil. And now you've got, you know, all the wild flowers, all the, the um, you know, the next stage of succession is coming along. Within a couple more years, you can be growing vegetables out there in the desert system. Uh, you do have to understand where the water is being held through the course of the annual cycle. So we we get we get very down and dirty when we start start talking about these sorts of things and how things shift um, as you're trying to grow different plants or what is you know well like with uh, climate change uh, we've got a challenge in front of us because we're going to have to stay ahead of where the temperature the typical temperature systems are now they're more they're like 150 um, miles is now what this is uh, present in your system and you would never have had those high temperatures if we hadn't um, started pouring carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and destroying our ability to hold water in the soil because we have no organic matter there so it's kind of scary don't want to scare you too much <laughs> and, you know there was a really good uh thing that came in chat that somebody said you know, about tips uh in growing in desert areas do whatever you can to try to sequester as much water as you can there are there are different techniques of creating basins and things like that so then when you do have the rain events you're you're moving water to those areas that you really really want to make sure that are able to trap and hold on to that um i'll give a plug to somebody called brad lancaster who's wrote a series of books on you know making systems capture water in very dry dry climates um so there are a lot of techniques and things that you can do to be able to do that as somebody said, when you put the organic matter into the into the soil, don't the organisms in the soil just eat up that um, organic matter? And no, it doesn't. A certain percentage is going to be consumed by bacteria, which typically eat um, or decompose uh, organic material uh, that's only simple in structure. They can't deal with the wax that's on the surfaces of leaves or on the uh, a more difficult to decompose material like cellulose or lignin or various you know different kinds of um, humic acids and fulvic acids. Uh, so there's always a residue left which is going to be the food for those, the next stage of succession. So you can grow better crops. You can grow the more difficult foods and supply that to your community where you're getting the higher um, amount of money coming your way because you're growing the difficult stuff. Well, it's because they need more fungi than bacteria. They still need the protozoa, they need the nematodes, microarthropods, things like that. Uh, but learn what has to be in the soil around the plant you want to grow. And then make sure that you're getting enough organic matter in there. Some of the work that we've done with uh, uh, John Lu is where you put in um, tree trunks into the soil down at two, three feet to get enough organic matter into that soil that will last you for a very long time before you have to go back in and put another log in or hopefully you've built up the biology in that soil you've built up the the um, kinds of organic material that whatever plant you it, it is that you want to grow you can grow it because you are giving those organisms the conditions that they require in order to be able to grow. You know, Elaine, something that I try to express to, you know, my clients and folks that I talk with as well is that the organisms really, you know, with regards to organic matter in the soil, they really transform it, correct? I mean, they they create all those biofilms, the glomulins, the glomulin related soil proteins and so forth that uh, still make up organic matter in the soil. 
Uh, it's just they're going through a transformation process. Do you think that's accurate or? Yeah, I think that is um, accurate, that we we are trying to get the types of organic material that are going to build soil structures. So now you're holding water in your soil. All of these different, we've got 12 different, uh, very important um, management that we have to have to grow these crops. And you can't, Uh, you can't find chemicals that will give you those conditions. So I, I know I want to move on to the, the next question, but I feel like we didn't do justice at the very beginning of this one, which is around the protozoan infusion and the um, the claim around air pollution, killing off all the protozoa on the surface of the leaves. Any comment we want to make to that before we move on? Well, so when we're brewing protozoan infusions, um, we want to have those protozoa um well, probably back up a step. When you're looking at what the biology is in the soil that you need to have, that's the first step. What's missing in your soil? What's missing on the surfaces of the leaves? And then that should determine for you what's the bacteria, fungi, protozoa, nematode communities that you um, are lacking and therefore, you're wanting to mix those organisms into the compost extract so that you can go and spray that out, get all of the surfaces, tops, bottoms, um, you know, flowers, seeds down in the root system. You want to make sure you're getting all of these organisms in the proper balances for the plant you're trying to grow. And maybe it's the protozoa that are lacking. Maybe it's the nematodes. Maybe it's the fungi. And you've got to use your microscope and learn what's missing and then brew a protozoan infusion if that's what you need. It might be the nematodes that need to be uh, extracted and grow, uh, add a whole bunch of those nematodes into the extract. So now you're delivering the missing organisms to the surfaces of your plant. There is no disease. There is no pest that can get through the line of protection if your plant has all of these different organisms growing on its surfaces there's no way the diseases and pests can get a foothold we show people pictures of of uh, leaves covered with a with a whole film of these microorganisms and not any diseases where right next door all of the plants are dying because no one ever put the right sets of organisms on the surfaces of those plants. They're spraying with pesticides. They're spraying with all kinds of nasty stuff. And those things just don't work. Get the biology in the soil. We want a huge diversity of protozoa, nematodes, microarthropods, earthworms, um, of the bacteria and of the fungi. We want them all. And the way you get that is to constantly be adding more just in little pinches just in you know a teaspoon that's all you have to have to inoculate your uh, compost or your um, pile of compost or your windrow of compost it spreads and as long as it's good healthy production um, you're not going to have to worry about the problems great thanks lane all right, let's move on to another question. This one's from Nicola. And the question is, what is the scientific basis behind the 135 micrograms per gram bacteria, fungi, and the 100 nematodes, et cetera, et cetera? And I know, Elaine, you could talk for hours about how you went through this process, but I think the genesis really is, you know, what was your kind of approach to to be able to come up with these these uh, numbers and, and the practices? It's, it's pretty simple. It, you know, we, we look at lots and lots and lots of samples uh, of the organisms and you start making the correlation that when I have this many bacteria, this many fungi, so bacteria should have at least minimum level, got to have, got to get to the minimum first, 135 micrograms per gram of your soil uh, bacteria. And then 135 micrograms of fungal biomass per um, uh, gram of your plant of your soil. 
you need uh, about 10,000 protozoa. You need about um, 100 nematodes per gram of material. That's maybe a little bit on the high side. You could probably manage on somewhere around 20 to uh, uh, two to five nematodes as long as the good guys um, and then uh, get that on into the surface you know so water in the the compost extract make certain that the above ground plant parts are all covered with this uh, layer of uh, the minimum level now what if you wanted to double or triple your yields you would probably want to increase those organisms that the, the plant needs to be able to produce a higher amount of production, uh, more plant material. So what if you then got up to the next level and to the next level, you can grow more and more plant material because now they've got the minerals, they've got the water, they've got the protection from diseases and pests and problem organisms. So um, that's the scientific basis, start observing what gives you better yields? So try to keep that layer. Well, and then once you've got everybody at these higher levels, go ahead and double or triple something, uh, you know, a, a small pocket of 10, 10 uh, uh, acres or something like that, whatever, and see if you get increased yields. There are increased yields without the cost of tilling your soil that's an expensive process and you kill 50 percent of your beneficial organisms if you go through with a tillage a single tillage wipes out 50 percent of the organisms that are building the structure that are giving you the money when you sell this so we want to make certain that we're not wiping out so nature develop these interactions between the the organisms and the uh, plants and um, she's done a really good job why did we pretend about you know a hundred years ago why did we pretend that mother nature couldn't manage to do it herself so true it, it, elaine i feel like you must have looked at my slides with me before i went down to houston <laughs> <laughs> and shared about some of this. But I do want to refocus on one thing because Nicola has asked a question here that I've asked many times in the last two and a half years. And it took me a while to get my head wrapped around this. You are not going to find a paper out there in the published literature that says, here's exactly the amount of fungi that you need to regenerate your soils. No one has done that research. No one has done that research and published it through the university system and all that. So what this represents when we give these guidelines about biologically complete bio amendments is a lot of it is Elaine's lifetime of searching for these answers and saying, I saw this system start to take off when it hit this threshold of fungi or this threshold of nematodes. I saw this thing missing. And when I put a hundred of them back, it corrected and that might not satisfy everybody out there in the world, but we're not misrepresenting this, that a lot of that we call this Dr. Elaine's approach to soil regeneration. And while there are other scientists here, and trust me, we have interesting conversations Elaine and I, about papers and ideas and things. I also recognize that she has applied these principles in many circumstances and seen that when you hit these biological targets and we don't want you to stop at 135 we want you to go way beyond that minimum bar <laughs> minimum yep. bar how do you get over that hurdle how do you start to get the system working again it, you know my <laughs> liquid <laughs> you know from just the consultant standpoint uh these numbers have been tremendously helpful for me to be able to communicate with my clients i mean most of my clients come from the agrochemical world where numbers metrics all those things that's just the process that they go about and so for me what we'll do is we'll usually put targets and say our minimum bar is 135 micrograms per gram of bacteria and fungi 100 nematodes etc and so forth and that's saying hey look we are know we're changing the system when we start to get to those those thresholds are being met but that's again the minimum bar we want to push these systems much 
much, much, much farther. Um, and and it, it, I think it helps from my standpoint, working with my clients, because they know they have a target. They know they're well below it. They have a target they're trying to shoot to at least to try to get to that minimum bar. And then they're super excited. And once they hit that bar and it's like, all right, great. Now, where can we move to, right? Where do we really, really want to be? Um, and it's just a very good um, practical approach to be able to communicate this and, you know, measure it and, um, and let the other metrics in the farm also be a guide to this, you know, so our farmers are looking at what is their costs and what is their production values, how much water are they using? And we can come back and look and see, Hey, as we're making changes, to the microbiology, we're also seeing these other changes in the farm as well. And that really helps internalize, you know, how the system is actually transforming and how it's actually working. So. Thank you very much, Elaine, because it makes my job a lot easier by having this kind of information available to me. Okay, anything else, panelists? Anything else you guys want to add? All right, let's move on to the next question. Uh, this question is from Joe, and Joe asks, does one layer cardboard mulch kill microbes? Does irrigation with chlorinated tap water kill microbes? <laughs> 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 that's, go for it <laughs> that's, that's like that's kind of reversed from what i think the way i think about it you know does one layer of cardboard well if it's dead dry maybe it would um give you microorganisms but you said mulch so does a layer of of cardboard mulch presumably that's sucking up enough uh moisture from the air so you're dealing with something that's not going to be killing the mic these microorganisms there is nothing in cardboard that should be killing the micro or microbes it just might not be the the food that these particular microorganisms want so you've got to find out if when you add this cardboard what's going to grow what what's the food that the cardboard brings with it and if you're missing fungi, you may put in cardboard mulch and nothing happens. It's a great way of holding on to water, uh, but it's not helping your microbial world because you don't have any fungi. In that, well, is it soil? Well, you know, the bacteria are there, maybe a few protozoa, maybe some. So it's it's kind of not real happy soil. We've got to get up to our minimum levels. Does irrigation with chlorinated tap water kill microbes? Oh, yes, because you can't get rid of all of the chlorine that's in that water just by letting it fly through the air. So it depends on, you know, how long is that um, chlorine going to be able to dis degas, or maybe it's not going to degas. It's going to get absorbed by some of the um, uh you know, like the cardboard, my the chlorinated water on the cardboard. So you might want to check, you know, um, take not, you know, the irrigation water without any chlorine in it with the chlorine and add it to a certain amount of compost where you know exactly what the com biology is in that compost and find out if that chlorine is in fact killing your microorganisms. And the answer is going to be, oh, yeah. That's why we put chlorine into our drinking water is because it's going to kill the um, the horrible, nasty, disease-causing organisms. And we don't want to, you know, be drinking something that's got uh, salmonella, shigella, pasturella, all these um, uh, diseases that come from, um, you know, the, the waste um area or where they're trying to clean up water from the um, sewage um, uh, area. So it depends. My favorite two words. It depends. <laughs> and you got to kind of think things through about what the microorganisms are doing and, and what does the um, organic material. Is it food for the microbes that you want or is it food for the microbes you don't want? You know, I, I always think, you know, water quality is such an important thing. You know, our microbes depend upon good quality water in order for them to thrive. Um, and chlorinated water, like you mentioned, Lane, is not really great for microbes. So uh, we need to do something to be able to, if you have treated water, you need to do something to be able to uh, complex bind the chlorine or chloramine 
out of the system. You know, from a home standpoint, there are these fantastic filters. They're used a lot in the RV space, but they're just, they attach the garden hoses and they can, 10,000 gallons of water can go through them before you need to replace them. And you can, you know, really remove a tremendous amount of chlorine out of the system. So if you're a home person, there are some easy solutions. If you're talking about agriculture, there's plenty of different other ways uh, of, of treating the water quality. They're a little bit more complex, but uh, we definitely do it. We wanna make sure that we're, we're providing good, good moisture or water to, uh, to the crops. All right, anything else, panelists, you guys wanna add to this question? Okay, let's move on. Uh, this question is from Surrender, and the question is, Hi, my question is, I have heard different opinions about crop rotation and companion planting for market gardeners. How important is it to have both? My view is if we grow soil, we can get both issues taken care of, uh, take care of as naturally as possible. I've so, been talking way too much here. So, All right, who else wants to jump in? Adam Loida? It's your turn, um, Loida. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, let me see. let me see if I can understand the this question. So, what is the problem with using crop rotation and compl companion planting? You mean compl companion planting? Yeah, I think Pl planting. Yeah, planting. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, crop rotation and companion planting for market gardeners. How important it is it, to have both of them? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's really important to have. Uh, I mean. For market gardeners, um, thinking they're you know the 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 cash crop is, um, uh, you know, being pulled out when when they harvest it, uh, because it's usually um, uh, they usually I I mean even if they had perennials, uh, with the perennial I don't think it would be a problem having a companion plant with the with the cash crop, but if it was an annual crop then I don't see the problem with having both. In fact, it would be beneficial to the organisms because you would have uh, more crops in the soil covering the soil and protecting the microbes. Yeah, one thing that comes up for me quite a bit, I've got a couple market gardener uh, clients, companion planting, oh man, I love that. I think that's fantastic. You're adding diversity of plants, which are going to drive diversity of microorganisms in the soil. I think it just builds for a much healthier environment. So companion planting, right on. Crop rotation is a weird one because, you know, for most senses, people are doing crop rotation specifically because they have disease pressures and they feel like they have to do the crop rotation. So it's it's required for them. Um, I have a market gardener client where she built all this really complex trellising system and didn't really necessarily want to do crop rotations, and but, but she was having all the disease pressures. We were able to resolve the disease pressure so that she could replant the tomatoes in the same spot year after year without having to do a rotation. Uh, I'm not saying that rotation is a bad thing. Like Lloyd said, rotating is great for introducing diversity and so forth. Uh, but once you really get a highly functioning soil food web, the requirement of having to rotate because of disease pressures goes away. So your, your rotation just simply becomes, is it because of you know availability of time frame and planting plants and those kind of things? You have much more flexibility, I think, at that point. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with you, Brian. And, you know, actually, I'm just have space for a container garden right now. I'm spending a lot of the space in my container to do diversity. <laughs> like my tomatoes have basil in the same container with them. Mm -hmm. um, I've got alyssum and marigolds and sunflowers to help bring in pollinators. There's so many ecosystem services that cannot be attained in a monoculture, right? And mm -hmm. so you said it really well that if the diversity above ground is reflected below ground with the microorganisms that we're feeding. I think the important thing here is, again, to go back and say, there's not a recipe. Everybody is going to have to work this out in their own plot of land with their own system. They shouldn't just take a prescription from anybody. You know, I love all of these kind of rock star celebrity soil regen farmers but sometimes they're like oh in south dakota i did this and it fixed everything and i'm like well that's not going to work in costa rica right they have not they they're not giving you a recipe they're teaching you principles and right. one of the principles of regenerative agriculture is increase diversity as much as possible agreed yeah and i think that's the nice thing here is, is teaching people 
the, the principles behind it so they can critically think through how is that going to apply to their operation? Because everybody's different. I mean, I don't have any client that I, I could just say it's prescriptive from one to the next. It's just, yeah, I'll just do what they did. We'll do it over here. Every client is different. The way they run their operation, what the crops they're planting, all, there's a tremendous amount of variables that go into it. Um, so, but I think if, you know, what my goal is, is to make sure that my clients walk away with having the grounded knowledge that says, this is what's happening. And if I do X, what's potentially going to happen to my crop. If I do Y, what's potentially going to happen to my crop. Now they're critically thinking about it versus just a recipe that they're trying to put into place. Okay, anything else we want to add here, panelists, before we move on? All right, next question is from Maria. The question is, how do you regenerate soil that is mostly clay? We get this all the time. Um, who wants to take this one? Lots of organic matter. <laughs> You've got to dilute the uh, factor, the fact that you've got these really small um, mineral particles. They're about the size of a bacterium and uh, trying to build uh, a decent soil all on just the, the clay um, dirt, you're not going to be, yeah, you're not going to be happy. So start getting that compost made and get that mixed into the soil. We typically will mix um, the compost itself in on the lines where the plants are going to be planted. And we're walking up and down the rows outside the those rows that the, your plants are going to be planted in. Don't worry too much about that. Um, get the biology working on uh, the uh, organic matter. So you might put in some um, more compost that's more on a woody side on top of the compost you put a little bit below that and then start applying the compost extract. And so the, you know, two, uh, a week from you put in the compost and you applied your first application of compost tea a week later, check and see what you've got in the soil. Did everything come along exactly the way you wished? Uh, no. So what is it that I'm still missing? And so you just go through that first year, checking up and making certain that you're getting all of the groups of, of organisms, you're maximizing the diversity. Um, and that's going to get you moving along to that place in time where you take your sample at the beginning of the growing season, and you say everybody's home. They're, they're just waiting. You don't have to be doing anything. Now, how much money are you spending on your biological system? Zero. And yet you're making the best yields you've ever had. You don't have disease. You don't have to be watering very much, if at all, because your root systems are getting down to that area where you're getting the water and you don't need to be irrigating as much or at all if you're if you're living in a place like Minnesota or here in Oregon or in a place where there's pretty consistent rainfall who else has stuff to add I was just going to add, Lane, that, um, you know, in the FC courses, you talk about, you know, uh, example of a sandy soil. And then over time with the microbiology that's there, it looks and behaves not like sandy, but like a loam soil. Um, and it, what's great is I'm actually working on a project right now where we're doing kind of a really deep set of research. And one of the things we're looking at is soil texture. And the areas where we're doing treatments, we're seeing it going from a mostly sandy soil to a sandy loam soil. And uh, the soil scientists that are in there are like, all right, this is happening way, way faster than you could do in, you know, glacial time, right? It's from transforming sands to silts and clays and that type of thing. So they're, they're kind of blown away. They're like, wow, this is a fast transformation of the texture of the soil going from sandy to now a sandy loam. And it's every time it's just moving farther and farther into that loam category. So um, yeah, it's great. It's fun to see. How long does it take to uh, get the root systems or how deep can the root systems go in, uh, uh, in if you're dealing just with dirt versus how deep can the root systems go if you're dealing with a good rich good mixture of sand, silt, and clay with massive amounts of really good organic matter, how deep down can the roots go? Right. I, I would like to add something to this. 
uh, because it reminds me of a personal experience, uh, an experience that I had, uh, I had in the past. Uh, now, the, the answer to this question will change depending on the situation, uh, uh, the person's situation. But uh, I had a client who had uh, really high clay soil, and we de decommissioned uh, an area of his farm for one growing season, and we put in there an annual cover crop with different depths uh, uh, of the root system, and we applied uh, extract all season, all, during the entire rainy season. I was surprised myself how uh, how fast over, over the course of two, three months, uh, that soil was so soft. And it was because of the combination of the extract that we applied with the biology. And when this annual, uh, uh, plant when these uh, plants died, uh, the the roots also uh, 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 died and became organic matter in the soil. And yep. and then I can stick my hand uh, into the the clay soil uh, pretty deep to like my my uh, my wrist. So you know, there's many things that you can do to improve clay soil. Uh, and what I'm sharing is just one one way, I think. It's amazing how fast it happens too, isn't it, Lloyda? It, it, yeah. does, it blows my mind. And sometimes it's, wow, that transformation was quick. Yeah. Well, most people think of like turf grasses and things. They only go down a couple of inches. And when we get back in there and, and get the biology moving and everything's humming along, all the organisms are buzzing around, um, instead of... Uh, going only a couple of inches, the root systems on the that grass ha, have been documented at being at something like 15 to 25 feet. You don't need to have to worry about watering. Mm -hmm. Even in the right. desert, you're pretty well set as long as you allow that biology to function. All right. Well, you know what? We're at the top of the hour, folks. This flew by fast today. <laughs> Great questions from the community. So I have a couple of housekeeping things I need to get through before we uh, actually close the webinar. Just want to remind everybody about the Restoring to Nature webinar series. So we've already done webinar one. We just completed now webinar two. And don't forget, we have webinar three, Restoring Watersheds with Andrew Millison and John Liu at 11 a.m. Pacific time frame on Thursday, April 18th. And remember, these are on-demand webinars, so if you want to rewatch um, or you missed any of the other previous ones, by all means, go ahead and check those out. All right. Uh, well, let's just give a, a great big thank yous to the support staff that really helps make these webinars go from uh, informing all of you and all the technical stuff that happens behind the scenes. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for uh, the folks that make this happen. Then I'd also like to thank our panelists. Again, it's always great that you guys are willing to share your knowledge. Um, this is fantastic to, to be able to get the information out there. Uh, and thank you again for your expertise and your time. And thank you, Brian, for being the moderator for this. Um, good job. No, thank you. I was no, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> what did I say? No, thank you. <laughs> I don't want said, any of no your worries. silly. Thank you. <laughs> And for Sandy I, and all the others who help uh, make this happen. Thank exactly. you very much. Yep. It's a great uh, team of folks that, that really do pull all this together. And also thank the audience too. Thank you for your attendance and, and posting great questions. With that being said, we, we got webinar three coming up in just a little bit. So we'll see you guys there. Thank Here's, you all. Take care. Ciao.